Welcome to Basketball on Big Roa, the only podcast breaking down everything happening with the Lakers, Clippers, and Sparks. I'm your host, Evan Garcia, and joining me today, back like he never left, Dar E and Viziri, aka Dine Dropper. Dine, we took a, a, an episode off. You weren't feeling well. How are you doing now, man? Doing well. Unfortunate that uh, it was just. We were unable to record last week. Uh, didn't miss too much, though. Lakers were doing well. Clippers, I don't even remember what games that covers. But, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I I got most of them on the channel if I went to the game or something like that. But I'm feeling well. Yourself? Good, good, man. I mean, I'm I'm living off the the Lakers bucks. You know, I don't, I don't fear the deer, Dime. That's what I know. I do not fear the deer because your favorite – Coach of all time, uh, pull the master class. You know, the one thing I don't know about Doc's greatness, but I know one thing he's really, really good at is blowing fourth quarter leads. And oh boy, did he give us a, a detailed basketball breakdown of that. But we're going to get into more of that later. And we're going to get into the games later. But I'm going to have to go a little off menu, uh, a little peek behind the curtain. Dime was like, hey, how are we doing the script? You know, what's going, what's going on? So, you know, we, we talked a little bit, of, chopped it up for a few seconds there on what this episode's going to look like. I didn't tell him. Forget all that. I have to hear, and at first I got to apologize because my uncle was just off out of his pocket. <laughs> he saw Dime recording his uh, recap uh, vlog and all that uh, outside of Crypto.com Arena. And he just, I don't know, Dime, explain what happened with my uncle there. He's not actually my uncle, but, you know, <laughs> I'm guessing we, we have similar heritages there. Dime, what was going on with that guy just like, berating you about the Clippers and number one and all this. And, and, and I didn't know you, I didn't know you have to owe, owe your apology as well. I, did, I didn't know your Spaniard was that good. Uh, break it down for me like a fraction. What was going on over there? <laughs> Dude, I'm just standing in my normal post game spot, just recording my post game thoughts, which is my last video at the end of every vlog I post is my thoughts. After I interview fans this season, I've been interviewing fans after the games. Right. And I just film my thoughts at the end. And I always post that to Twitter, but that's always the end of the vlog. I'm just doing it like normal. And then all of a sudden, this drunk guy comes and starts putting his hand on my back. And I'm like, okay, it's just another hammered individual trying to get on the video. So I'm like, this is going to make for comedy content, I was thinking. And it absolutely was. But then he just kept on going while I was trying to finish my piece. He just kept <laughs> going. And dude, then he started getting a little touchy. And I was like, no me toques. And then I was like, it was just, I just knew it was making for gold content. So <laughs> he definitely had a great moment. That was maybe the most iconic post-game interview of the season that we've had. So never a dumb moment in Los Angeles. I, I always tell people that when, when the Lakers are down and stuff, they're like, oh, does it, you know, is it hard for you to, to report? I'm like, with the Lakers, it's never boring because even when we're down, it's a tire fire. We, we don't fail quietly, right? It's an epic collapse with like Carmelo and Russ and, and you know, players are calling other players vampires and the trade machines going off and all the Laker haters are in droves. So I'm like, you know, I always say, you know, obviously I prefer everyone's winning and it's happy but i'm like it's never boring i'll tell you that it's never boring <laughs> and yeah crypto.com arena is never boring when dimes there uh you know my uncle monday night feeling himself it was hilarious and yeah the the spanish just really threw me off i i know you're a cultured individual but i just when you were saying tranquilo tranquilo i'm like yo wait hold on i i, I think i th that that tongue sounds a little native there that was i i didn't realize it was it was not like rough spanish it was like pretty smooth like that wouldn't have shook me if you know someone i knew uh was talking like that. Like, oh okay fine so i was like okay darn. i didn't know i didn't <laughs> know you had it like that i'm impressed well, well because um when i was young my parents worked six days a week so they had, I had like a babysitter you know and she was from guatemala but she lived with us she lived with us at the house six days a week so for, until i was like eight years old and she moved to houston but it was basically like I was learning English, Spanish, and Farsi all at once as a kid. Wow. So I am essentially learning it just how kids that are raised by Latin mothers would learn. So the only tough part is it's a little choppier now, I'd say, because I'm not around Spanish speakers as much in terms of speaking Spanish with them. And that is terrible. I, you know, I just don't want to lose it. So I've always contemplated like going to a Spanish speaking country for like a year and living there just to solidify it. But yeah, man, it's uh, that's how it is. That's why I sound like that. 
Yeah, that, no, I was impressed. We, maybe we got to do a few, uh, maybe during, uh, you know, Spanish Heritage Month, we can do, we can try to do a, an episode all Spanish. Yeah, that'd be pretty, that'd be pretty lit. <laughs> but no, yeah, I have a similar, we'll, we'll get into the basketball in just a moment, but I have a similar story. Obviously, you know, for anyone looking on, on YouTube or whatever, you could probably tell I'm, I'm Hispanic. I'm actually, people mainly think I'm just, just Mexican, but I'm actually half, I'm uh, Mexican, Puerto Rican. That, that's the whole makeup there. And the same thing for me, obviously my parents were all, you know, Latino. So like it was all Spanish, but you know, they spoke English, but they went to, you know, work as well, just like your parents did. And when they were too busy, I was actually babysat on my aunt who doesn't know a lick of English. So like, I was like five years old. So very, very young. And I mainly spoke Spanish, English, a little Spanish. And then they just dropped me off at my aunt's house. And she's like, I only know Spanish. So it's, it's all Spanish. I'm like, oh, I gotta really learn this now. And it's the same thing. I was extremely good. Like seven-year-old Edwin would mock current age Edwin in Spanish because that that kid had to know it like you cannot eat or get water if you do not know how to ask <laughs> for said things you know so I was really good got a little bit off got a little better now I'm somewhere in the middle because just like you even though LA is very diverse it's also very diverse so I don't have to speak Spanish there's plenty of not you know English speaking people around so it's not as good as it used to be but um yeah it's always something you got to keep sharp so all right now that we got through with my uncle's tirade on Dimes' video, we can get into the games. We're going to start with Lakers uh, uh, playing the Sixers on Friday. So we'll start with the weekend games and then move on from there. A uh, surprising win. I described this as an ugly win. That was, I think, the word everyone used. Because even though Lakers won 101-94, it was an ugly game. You, you didn't have, obviously, Embiid for the Sixers with him being out. But the Lakers just looked flat lackadaisical uh it looked like they just kind of played good enough to win in the end which of course at this late in the season as you know dime hey winning like we'll figure the rest out later it's better than losing and still having to figure it out but it was an ugly win it was it's one of the few times you know I, I i remind myself how lucky i am to do what i do and for us to do what we do you know th this this sport was always talked about growing up and now it, it, it's our careers it's amazing that was the first time i was like I mean, yeah, it's amazing, but this game sucks. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this one, this one, I like this kind of feel like work. This game's bad. They did win, but it was an ugly game. I got to write about this ugly game. I'm not going to pretend it wasn't a rough performance. And, and that was my experience. One time, you know, I know you were sick and stuff, so I'm not sure how much did you watch. Did you watch this game? If you did, what are your thoughts? And if not, you know, go ahead and shoot me some questions about uh, Lakers Sixers since I was in the building. Well, that was my – about a day or two after I was – okay clear to you know go back outside and stuff so i was actually at a bar with uh one of my co-workers that i worked with when i was with the rams for that one year yeah. i hadn't seen him since then so we were at a bar and we were watching march madness and the laker game was on a tv so I watched a little bit of it and i saw the the way the lakers closed out and got the job done and so i can't give you detailed analysis but i will say moral of the story for me lebron and ad still bringing it 20 plus points from each of them and Anthony Davis with 23 points and 19 boards. Uh, and then LeBron, you know, still with eight rebounds, six assists, eight turnovers. Jesus Christ. I didn't even realize that. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, turnovers uh, were really sloppy uh, throughout the game. That game had so a lot of turnovers. My question is, I guess, to you is, did LeBron and AD play well? Did the stat AD's stat line suggest that he did. Uh, four blocks as well. And I remember seeing them do good things. But, again, I'm watching it with, you know, a bar and I'm watching other games. So it's not, you know, yeah. not focused. No, uh, AD was like the only one who probably gets a pass on this game. It's like, no, I did my job. Like everyone else is like, you know, I, I think LeBron uh, had like, you know, two points at the end of the first quarter and like four at the, the half. You know, it was just like a slow, rough game. He was kind of passive and a lot of mistakes, a lot of turnovers from the whole team. Uh, the whole team had a lot of turnovers overall. Um, I'm looking here at the stats. I think it was like 21 or something. Uh, they had 21. Yeah, exactly. Boom. Remember to be perfectly. Yeah, 21 turnovers. So it was an ugly game. But AD was the one kind of keeping it afloat, even like through like the second, third quarter. Like, it's like oh, he's balling. And he's kind of keeping them, you know, within within range. And then, like you said, they were able to kind of close it out in the fourth quarter. So it was one of those games, ugly game. Uh, you kind of move on. But, hey, they got the win. That's what matters, especially, you know, this late into the season, like I said. All right, moving on. Same day. Clippers, Blazers, uh, they already beat them before. We're not going to talk about that game. We're just going to talk about the Friday game. And on, on this one, they also uh, pulled out the W, 125-117. Uh, uh, so, Dan, what were your takeaways here for uh, one of the few, I think actually the only uh, Clippers uh, W we're going to talk about yet? Yeah, that's the only one we're going to talk about because it's the one we had 
Uh, what was this Friday matchup like? I know you you just mentioned you were like in a different setting. Did you watch it later? Did you watch it then? Uh, and what were your thoughts on it? Watched it later, and I think it was very similar to the Wednesday Blazers game. Just a team that's tanking and the Clippers being better than them. I think the yeah. Stars in both games played more like Stars. Terrence Mann had a 20-point game, though, in this one, in the Friday one. So that was great to see because he missed the one on Wednesday. But to see him get 20 points, he hasn't had many 20-point games this season. Good for his confidence. And you're just hoping with those two wins that the Clippers can start building a streak towards the end of the season because they've been playing so badly. And that was a little bit of optimism. I'm going to get to it in a second, but very clearly it was just beating bad teams, a bad Portland team. Yeah, I, we haven't talked as much about man just because, you know, it's been so much about, you know, Harden and PG and uh, Kawhi and Russ, which we'll talk about later, and, and Zoo. But I, I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, you're like a big, like, man defender, right? I think I think you're, you're kind of uh, part of the unit there. What, what are your overall thoughts on, on just Terrence Mann as a player? As a player? Wow. Um, I think he is a good role player. I've previously said that he can be a role player on a championship team. This season, though, he is, for the first time, to me, a lot of people say that he hasn't improved at all since 2021. I disagree with that. I think if you watch him in the 2022 season, he definitely improved. He had a bigger role than in 2021, got minutes throughout the season. Then last year, I thought he was fantastic when he was playing, but it was that whole thing about Terrence not playing enough and you know, eventually started, and then they got Russ, and then after that his role diminished. So this is the first season where he's gotten a consistent spot. He's been starting all year. And he has been a little disappointing, you know, on both ends of the floor. I think he's a solid defender, good at best, but he's not great. He's not a guy that, you know, if he's your best defender at the point of attack, I don't know if you're a championship team. And we've seen that this season. And I think he's a solid shooter, but he is not a very confident shooter. And sometimes when he hesitates, when he gets open from three, it can hurt the offense. It can hurt him, that hesitancy, but he's much better in a fast paced game. I think his athleticism is hindered when you play slow, the way we're playing. He's fantastic on the break. He's really strong getting to his right hand. I think he's a good attacking closeouts, high IQ basketball player moves very well without the ball and cuts. And I think he's very well-rounded, a utility guy, like a Bruce Brown kind of, but mm. we'll see how he does in the playoffs. Cause this regular season, he's been a little disappointing. His three-point shot was struggling massively in the beginning of the season, and it's come uh, come back, you know, in this calendar year of 2024. But Terrence did that, you know, what he did in the playoffs. He's the curse breaker. He's the one that had that 37 – was a 39-point game against the Jazz in game six, was huge in game five, was big in game seven against the Mavs. He is – the bigger the game, Terrence usually plays better. So we love him, and he's one of my favorite Clippers of all time, and he's my favorite player on the team now. And he always he cares so much, and that's what I love yeah. about him. You always you always are going to get top effort from Terrence. So let's see how this yeah. playoffs goes. And right now he's been whatever, but there's bigger problems than Terrence for sure. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. And that's that's kind of where I where I thought you were with him. But since we haven't talked as much about Terrence on the show, I figured let, let's kind of unpack that a little bit. All right. So again, winning against a, a team underperforming, but those are the wins you definitely have to have to pick up, especially. You know, now that we're we're in late March here. All right. Uh, next game is Lakers against Pacers. Uh, this one, Lakers won 150, 145. Absolute banger of a game, just explosive offensively, right? Like there's certain teams in the NBA when you play them, you know, it, it's like it's like it's like boxing matches, right? Styles make fights. And then this one is like with the Pacers and the Hawks, even though the Hawks aren't a good team this year, when you play them, you're gonna have to run. Like something about them, they just push the pace, and then you start pushing the pace. And next thing you know, you're just kind of like playing to their style. And the Pacers are like, you know, the goats of that. They, they're leading the league in points, number two in offensive rating, number two in pace. They're going to make you go up and down and kind of run with them. And even though the Lakers were able to win that like scoring bout, you know, it, it was not pretty offense defensively. They weren't able to really stop them. It was 150, 145, right? Uh, they did get the win, which is what matters most. And they were able to kind of, you know, beat them at their own game, kind of matching blow for blow. And this was a, a Another big AD game, right? 36 points, uh, 12 rebounds. Uh, he was incredible. 16 to 29. So he was being aggressive and shooting well uh, with that aggression, well over 50% from the field. So he, he was, I think, one of the, the shining players, as was um, uh, we had a, a, a good game from, I think it was Dinwiddie, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let me see here. 
Um, yeah, yeah Dinwiddie had 26 because uh, D'Lo was out, right? He had a non-COVID illness. I don't know, maybe him him and, uh, and Dime were at the same bar or something. I don't know, drink up in the same cup or something happened there because he also had a, an illness, so he was out, and Dinwiddie stepped up, right? 26 points. I, I was talking to Dinwiddie uh, along with the rest of the media about a week ago about his role, and not that he was dissatisfied, but he kind of mentioned that it's different for him because he's used to, like, I'm the guy or I'm going to be one of the high-volume scorers on a team. And with the Lakers, that's not the case, right? It's LeBron, it's AD, even D'Lo's the head of um, you know, uh, the, the pecking order. He's like a back-of-the-rotation fringe guy. So he's not going to get the same kind of opportunities he's used to getting. And he talked about adjusting to that. He's accepting that. He understands that's his role, but it's a different role than he's used to. So it's nice to see on a night like this where – Hey, you're you're back to kind of what you what you're used to, you know, getting you know 25 plus minutes. You get to cook, you get to shoot. What are you gonna do? And what did he do? He dropped 26 points in 35 minutes. So you know he did his thing. So he showed that he showed anyone who's like skeptical that he can still do it. Eight for eleven from the field. That that's incredible. Eight for nine from the free throw line. And yeah, he he took advantage of that opportunity. And those opportunities are gonna come here and there. And you need guys like that, right? Dan, you need guys that can maybe in one playoff game, get hot and kind of push you over the edge. It's those kind of guys that can really be backbreakers for teams. That's what that's what Denver, I think, is so good at. It's not just that Joker's like probably the best player on the planet and that Murray's amazing. That helps. But it, it's the, the to me, the, the devastating thing about a team like that is Gordon and having, um, you know, MPJ going off and, and you know, and having CP um, – out there that's what really makes it like oh man now even the role players are hitting all their shots and i mean what are we supposed to do then and that's what really becomes demoralizing and dinwiddie stepping up with d'lo out uh that was huge this was the most points a lakers team scored since the 1987 showtime lakers who scored i think 155 and it took them overtime that's the record but 150 uh pr- pretty wild and a good win for the lakers there yeah this game against the i mean you know as you said you know the pacers are going to play this game was super up and down, a lot of points, not a lot of defense being played. And I think the big thing that stands out is the Lakers getting the win without D'Lo because I saw that before the game, they were saying that the Lakers were 0-5 this season without D'Angelo Russell. Spencer Dinwiddie, who's been a little bit of a disappointment so far, has that big game. Would you say his best game as a Laker thus far? Oh, yeah, not even close. Uh, I think it's his best game. And, again, we don't know how the season's going to go, but I think no matter what, it's already a W. They got him on the buyout market. He had a game like this, which maybe you don't give him the full credit for the win, but he gets a big credit. And then he had that game-saving block against the Bucks a couple weeks back. You know, So I think definitely that might be still his highlight, but best game, yeah, it's this one for sure. And like you said, they needed it with D'Lo out. Right. And I think you just got big contributions offensively from several guys. You got AD with 36. You got LeBron with 26 and 10 assists. You have Austin Reeves with 25, 11 of those coming from the foul line. Spencer Dinwiddie, 26. So four players with 20-plus points. Then you even get 14 points on 75% shooting from Torian Prince off the bench. So offensively, he was humming 56% from the field and 48% from three. And I really liked the way LeBron was playing off the ball. I thought there were moments where he was coming off screens and looking to post up and cutting really nicely and being the screener and roller. And I really think when LeBron uses his off ball abilities, even going back to when he was in his prime, it makes him that much more lethal to have that great of an athlete and good of a player in movement. So good stuff from LeBron and a a solid win for the Lakers to just keep kind of racking up these wins against these Eastern conference teams. We didn't really talk about the Atlanta game, but that was just, you know, against the team that doesn't really guard. They didn't, Shit the bed like the Clippers did, <laughs> and they uh, got the job done against them. And it's funny yeah, because they've been... the Clippers keep losing to the same team the Lakers keep beating nowadays. And these no double L's in LA. You just beat the Clippers and lose to the Lakers, kind of like the old days. Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of a lot of splits, and we'll we'll get to another one. Actually, another one right now. Uh, we have the uh, Clippers losing to the Sixers, one twenty one one zero seven. This one surprised me, Dime, because. Again, with the Sixers struggling, I figured uh, they're going to get this. Like, they'll get this win. And then, you know, as as we kind of entered the fourth, I still kind of thought that the, the Clippers were going to take care of business. And then um, talk, talk to me about what happened. Why was I wrong? What what happened that, that changed this game from a Clippers W to a, a, a Sixers W? You know, they started out the game hot. Tobias Harris was cooking us, and they were up 12 after one. I was at this game, another one of those Sunday afternoon games. 
And we were starting to get going in that third quarter, only down by five points. But the fourth quarter, we just ran out of gas. And it feels like, again, the Clippers just look old. They look slow. They get beat down the court very frequently. And when their legs go offensively, and they're not generating a lot of good shots. And it's not like we're not generating a good shots a lot, but there are possessions where we're not generating great looks. And when you mix that with just generally going cold and losing your legs a bit, then teams get out and transition off our misses. And then you really see the age, the inability to get back. Also just kind of a lack of intensity defensively in terms of like communication and just individual one-on-one defense. And the Clippers, you know, they switch so much and they switch very softly. You know, when, when guys just sometimes set little brush screens, don't even really make full contact, they'll, they'll switch on and off mm-hmm. the ball. And I think we're starting to see a laziness defensively. Uh, James Harden actually was our best player in the first half. Second half, he went completely ghost. Mind you, this is against his former team. And defensively, he's starting to look like the James Harden that we all remember defensively. And you know what that means. Not very good. And and then the funny part was Ty Lue waved the white flag because James Harden and Paul George lined up to start the fourth, did so poorly. He was like, you know what? We got a back-to-back. I'm not even going to put Kawhi Leonard back in the game. He and Zoo didn't re-enter the game. And we just took the L. Tyrese Maxey cooked us in the fourth. We could not guard. Our defense was just garbage. Again, just like against Atlanta. It was garbage. So you're starting to see a team that looks old, slow, and can't guard that it peaked early. That's what you're starting to see. The three seed is mm-hmm. out of question. And it's going to be the same story when we talk about the Indiana game in a second. Yeah, no, we, I, I, I was, you know, again, I'm not, I don't relish in, in, in the Clippers losses like I used to, mainly because, you know, I, I've been more of a sympathizer doing the pod and, and meeting so many people. I'm like, yeah, they're actually not that bad. So, but I was like, I just don't see the first, you know, being in line unless there is a run right here. And the opposites happen, right? Uh, there have been some some drops here. And now that one seat at this point is out the window. It's, it's more, in my opinion, we'll, we'll get to standing watch later about securing that four. And there you still have a chance, I think, at being a contender because you get home court in that game. And then the one seat's a crapshoot because I don't even know who that's going to be. So that might be a good matchup. It might be a bad matchup. So, uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll get into the standings and what might happen or, or how they can change. But, yeah, I, I was I was just like you. I was, I was disappointed in the result. I didn't think that – I thought they would come with the appropriate energy. I'm just not sure. We'll, we'll get into some of Ty Lue's comments later about uh, – he kind of called out some things, which is interesting. Uh, I do like Ty Lue's a coach. I think he does a good job of kind of, you know, um, being calm in moments of panic. The Clippers, they don't get as dramatic as the Lakers – but they also add the drama themselves with the players they have and the personalities they have. And I think Ty Lue, one thing he does do really, really well is navigate that. When they're down in series, when things aren't going their way, he, he's able to kind of calm things down and say, hey, we're fine. We're going to be okay. And, I, and I'll get some of his comments later on those things. But I was surprised that he did do that. That He said, you know what? Let's let's bring it back. And I think, I think he underestimated – uh, not the Sixers, but uh, how much his team needs these wins right now, that it's, it's kind of adding up. And he thought, oh, it's fine. We'll, we'll come with the appropriate energy the next game, and we'll talk about that one. And I think that's why he was he made the comments, you know, I'm hinting at later that, hey, you guys aren't really ready. Like, you know, okay, the schedule's lost or whatever, or we're, we're waving the white flag. We're waving the white flag today, not tomorrow. Like, you need to bring it. And, and we haven't been seeing that. Um, I, I'm curious to see if we'll see some changes in the, in the lineups and the rotations if you're right and they, they have tired old legs, well, then you have to find a way to pace that and have them ready for those clutch moments in the fourth. That's the whole point, right? That's one thing Golden State and, and Curry and Kerr are dealing with. He's trying to get them, keep them ready for those moments, but those non-Curry minutes are awful and it doesn't it ends up not mattering. So it's always a balancing act with older players unless you have someone like LeBron James who's a freaking god and he just plays like 42 and it's like, ah, he looks pretty good throughout the 42 like he did the other ones. But everyone else, it's something to navigate as these, as these stars are getting older. Um, modern medicines allow them to, to go for longer, but sometimes they're not as effective. And then, you know, it, it's hurting your team when, when they're such a big piece of the pie financially and, and, and are required for, you know, these big runs. Yeah, I mean, oh, it's it's very tough. Paul George and James Harden played five minutes and 34 seconds of that fourth quarter to begin it. And they both had zero points 
Yeah. Paul George turned the ball over three times in those five and a half minutes. They were both minus 14, and then that was it. They were done for the quarter, and they were done for the game. So those two, they're the they're – the, they're the, again, the reason why we don't reach our potential. Kawhi yeah. can be better too, though. I don't want to give him a full pass. I'll talk sure. about him a little bit more on the, in the Pacers breakdown. But, yeah, definitely uh, poor. All right. Well, let's get right into it. I mean, that is the order because Lakers bucks is on Tuesday. So Monday we had um, – uh, Clippers Pacers. This one, I, I was kind of again, we didn't do our predictions because we missed last week. I was 50 50 because the Pacers are just such a high powered offense that nothing surprises me with them. When they lose, I'm like, oh, it's because your offense wasn't going. And when they win, it's like, oh, your offense kind of like ran, you know, someone out. So they're, they're a tricky team to play. It's kind of like playing a team that, um, you know, just, just runs. They don't run a different offense, but it's just so high powered and so unique that like you're probably not ready for it on the regular season. So I definitely wasn't surprised by the result. But obviously, when you add them all up, it's disappointing. And, and the, the Pacers won 133-116. Here's where I'm going to bring in those comments from um, from Coach Lou, who said that the identity of his team right now is that they're soft. And I was like, geez, that's a harsh thing to say this late into the season. But he was asked about what the problems were. And that that's, I think that's, that's kind of talking about what you're talking about, the defense not being there. You're not being aggressive enough offensively. You're not taking enough shots. You know, you're turning the ball over. Those are – it's a juxtaposition to one player who came back, which is Russ. I mean, this guy freaking broke his hand just a few weeks ago. He, By all medical Googling you can do, he shouldn't be ready. But he's out there. Why? Because he's an absolute soldier, and that's the kind of energy you need. And, yes, you're missing that when Russ isn't there. But at this point in his career, Russ is a good rotation role player. He's not going to be a guy who's going to carry this team for weeks and weeks and weeks. He's a guy who brings you good energy. Maybe he can do it in a certain series or really step up in a couple games, but that's not that's not giving you a Larry O'Brien. Larry O'Brien comes from the other big three doing their job and then adding Russ's energy and all that. That's what takes you over the edge and takes like a, a six-game series you lose into a seven-game series you win, something like that, right? That's the difference. He, he, he helps you in the margins. You have to do the, the, the heavy lifting yourself. So 133-116, we already heard about my uncle saying the Clippers are still number one, <laughs> but we, I don't need to hear his thoughts anymore. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, you were in the building. You saw the game. Uh, Ty Lue called him soft. Uh, what do you think about that? I think he's right. I think right now we're not playing with any fight. We're not really playing with much resistance defensively. We switch everything, though. Partially it's on him, though. He needs to take a little bit of accountability as well because his scheme is that we switch all these matchups. and some of these guys just can't guard one-on-one -on -one against certain players. Norman Powell, he tries his best. Can't put him on guys like Siakam. We do these kind of things very frequently. James Harden, we switch him onto everyone. He's not a very good defender. That's putting it very nicely, by the way. Yeah. He's starting to show that he's, you know, the Clippers are the second worst defensive team in the league by defensive ratings since the All-Star break. Second worst in the league. We don't have any power forwards. So we lack athleticism. We're slow. And think about this, Edwin. We've used the same nine guys all season. The starting lineup. Then you have Russ, Norm, Amir, and then Tice. Plumley was injured. He doesn't, and that's like a tenth man. PJ Tucker's not been used all season. Bones Highland has not been used all season. Brandon Boston is not. We haven't used these guys. So those other players are tired. James Harden has played a lot of minutes. And I think Ty Lu made some mistakes in this game lineup wise. Uh, he wanted to combat Miles Turner's pick and pop ability by going to switch everything. And it just wasn't great because, again, we switched, they got to match up hunt. And then offensively, you know, one of the biggest reasons we're not the same as before, because our offense was what was carrying us in December and January, James Harden. He, he, it's happening, Edwin. I, you know what, Edwin? I'm so mad that I was suckered and peer pressured into admitting I was wrong. And saying, oh, you know, I was wrong. We should have made the move. Everything that I said is happening right in front of our eyes. Why did I deviate? Because of regular season. I saw that one seed and like, oh, my God, I, I did things to you me. You started growing the beard. And you saw that one seed. You're like, you know what? <laughs> I saw that one seed and it was 49 games into the season, over halfway. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, we're, we're guaranteed a top three seed. Now we're not going to get top three. And, like, we made the move to get a better regular season record. So – for the people that wanted Harden, what was the alternative? Being like the eighth or ninth seed? Yes. 
Yes, because then it would have been so clear to everybody that we need to do something different with this team. We need to go a different direction, which is what I've been wanting for since the summer. And that's another big reason why I didn't want Harden Edwin is because I knew, okay, if we're not winning that way, we're definitely not going to win with Harden. I can promise you that. We might just do a little better, get everyone's expectations higher, then crash out even bigger, which is exactly what looks like it's going to happen. And during the whole season, I have a player I can't stand watching on my team that's very hard to root for. I was not even happy when we were winning like that. Even though I acted happy and I was to a degree, there was a voice inside my head saying, you know this is bullshit. Like, you know this is not it. And I'm telling you, Edwin, it sounds like I'm being fake and phony, but we've <laughs> talked behind behind camera and stuff. And yeah. you know, I've never believed in championship with this guy. And that's not, and let me just say this. It is not solely because of Harden that we're playing badly. But I think he's the biggest difference from December and January, genuinely. He was getting us good shots every time down the court. Now it's gone to the point where I'm like, dude, we can't just do so much hard and pick and roll. Like it's gone to the point where I'm it's like back in the day. And you know why? What I mean by back in the day, meaning other years of my life, when do I really lock in on Harden? April, May. That's what we're yeah. getting to. And he's only getting older and he's been so healthy. I think that's another thing too, Edwin. These guys are not used to playing so many games recently. I respect that they've load, not load managed like that and they've attacked the regular season. I don't, Ty Lue keeps saying that they're not focused, they're not trying, they're not doing the little things right. I think it's because they're old. I and mean, that's why he keeps saying the same thing over and over. I don't know if there's a fountain of youth here, Edwin. This is, I've never seen it. Have you ever seen a team in your life in the regular season be a number one seed over halfway through the season and then fall off a cliff like this and it's not injury related? Uh, that's the caveat. I, I, was, I already had a couple ones. I know the Pelicans did it a little while back, but they had injuries. And not injuries. Halfway, and it wasn't over halfway through the season last yeah, year. Yeah, they were like they were like closer to like, you know, 35, 40, you know, a little under halfway at that time. Yeah, no, I can't think of a time. I will say, bless this brother this year. And and I know we say that all the time. And it, it have been other times it's been true, but it I mean the Lakers are eight, I think eight games above five hundred, and they're a nine seed. Like that's that's why <laughs> in the east, I mean, what, what would they be in the east? I think they'd be like um they would probably be at least a six seed. Uh, so that's the difference. Six to nine, that's a three t- that's a three tier drop, uh, you know, with the same record. And you see how the Lakers are pounding everyone in the East. I mean, if they're in the East, oh my God, it would be like, oh my God. Only team that could beat them for sure is Boston. And everyone else is like, I don't know, man. It's gonna be rough. <laughs> but of course, we're not in the East. We're, we're out here in the West Coast, Best Coast. Um, so I would say we're, we're gonna do things watching in a moment, but I would say I still hold out hope that they're gonna somehow this is a rough spot. And it's a rough moment. And not that they, they may not hit the the number one seed heights that you were envisioning. But I don't know. I still feel like Clippers Thunder. I still might go Clippers there. I think at this point, Clippers Nuggets. Them. We're not going to play them for a strong unless we're seven, unless we drop to a play in matchup, Edwin. No, we'll, we'll get to things later, but not really. If Denver drops a little and they get the one seed and you guys stay at four and you win that series, there it is. It would be the second round. You are oh, one second, Thunder, four Clippers. Second round. We are talking about the – we might not even win a – the way we're looking at it, we're not going to win a playoff game, but we're going to obviously win a playoff game. But winning a series <laughs> right now does not look – does not look like it's in the cards. I mean, who are we beating? I, I just don't believe in the Pelicans, to be honest. So that, that's the team I think – I think you I think y'all can take the Pelicans. And that will be the, the setup right now. Is going to be healthy? There's that's, no way we can beat the Pelicans with Ingram healthy the way we're playing right now. We have to have some kind of momentum because Kawhi, yeah. he's the – he. okay, let's say Kawhi turns up because right now, Edwin, Edwin, he's not – one thing I've noticed about Kawhi, and we got to really talk about this, is just the same way we got to talk about LeBron in the regular season now. The difference is LeBron's like 40 years old. That's the difference. Is I don't know if it's feasible with those two as your best players to get a top three seed anymore. And LeBron, I think they can be – I can think yeah. maybe top number two or three, but the number one has to be uh, incredible. And the, the problem with yeah, the problem with the Lakers is that AD is not a ball dominant player, so it's easier to get him out of an offense and and, and slow him down. He got Player of the Week uh, this past week, so he's he's been amazing and he's been great. But it's same thing with if Kobe was old and Shaq was young, there'd be a lot of problems for that same reason. Because like, well, Shaq can dominate, but Kobe's just too old. You know, you, you need to have a young ball handling guard slash wing to kind of be able to facilitate there. It, it's the same reason why the Spurs dynasty works so well. They kept bringing in young guards while Tim Duncan got older. If Tim Duncan was a guard, it'd be an issue. 
you have two guys and have been have been very good this year. Yeah, but like you said, the the, the age and the the amount of time, and I think I think I think you have a really good point about the they haven't played this much. The mental toll and all that is also part of it. Oh, it's more games and, and they only get more important and it's ramping up. They honestly they just need like a week off. I think they, they need a week off they can't get to be like, you know what, step away from all this, reset, and let's gear up. But uh, as you know, the NBA season doesn't, doesn't go like that. So I have to I would have to check the schedule, see if they, they can at least get like three days off at some point. Maybe avoiding the play-in is gonna give them a little refresher heading into the first round. They definitely need a reset. Um and, and Tyloo's going to have to navigate that. I think that's his, his most important thing. We've seen this Clippers team be very, very good. These are the same players that were very, very good. And it wasn't a fluke. It was weeks and weeks and months and months. He's got to find a way to channel that again and get them to that level, or else it's going to be more stuck in the mud. Everyone knows what time it is in the NBA. Everyone's bringing their best. You know, you no one's, you know, um, going to take their foot off the, the gas here. So I don't know. We'll see. But But, yeah, it's not looking good. This was a bad week for them. And we'll have to see how things go moving forward when we look at the standings watching upcoming games. So final game we're we'll talking about Lakers Bucks. This was a banger. Lakers win <laughs> double OT 128-124. Absolutely ridiculous game. I mean, I'm still buzzing off of it. And it was like three, four hours ago. And I'm still like, oh my God, what an incredible game. And LeBron James missed it again, that ankle issue on the back-to-backs. Is it load managing? Is it him just saying, hey, I, I can't do all the back-to-backs like this? I don't know. We'll see. They also have another game tomorrow against the Grizzlies. So if he misses that one, that's definitely going to be something I'll be concerned about. I assume, I don't have information, but I assume he will play. But I'm not super confident either way. I'm like 60% he'll play. So we'll see how he's monitoring that that pain in his ankle. But So he was out. So with him out, I assume, you know what, the Lakers aren't going to win this game. It's a scheduled loss, right? First game of a six-game road trip. LeBron's out. You got Giannis and Dame and Chris Middleton and, and the great Doc Rivers, and they're at home. They're going to wax them. And I was right for the first three quarters. It was exactly how it was going to happen. And, you know, a little, little again, peek behind the curtain, I, I write the game recaps on the road for Silver Screen and Roll. So I, I was pretty much done, Dime. <laughs> when the fourth quarter came, all I was waiting for is let me write down a little bit of what happens in the fourth quarter. Let me have the uh, final stats for the key players at the top. And that's it. I have my headline. I got my pictures ready. I got my story. It's over. And boy, oh boy, the Lakers said, no, no, no. <laughs> That's not how this works. And slowly, too, it wasn't like right away. Because uh, they started the fourth quarter with no AD. I thought the same thing. Are they just going to wave the white flag and, and not even bring them back? And the, the Bucks scored four points right away. And they brought AD in. And I'm like, That's kind of weird because now it's like an 18 point lead. And you, you bring AD in with other 10 minutes to go. And slowly but surely, you know, Hilo hits a three. Reeves hits a three. AD's hitting threes. He's blocking shots. And I'm like, oh, 8-2 run. 12-2 run. 16-4 run. I'm like, are they really going to do this? And I don't know when I started to believe, but at a certain point, I had to start rewriting all my stuff. So I'm like, okay, the, the, the story's not uh, they got waxed. The story's at least going to be they came back and they lost or they came back and won. And then it just kept going. We're going to get into all the details. We had a 2020 game from AZ. He was phenomenal. He, with all the blocks he had, he had a big block in overtime to secure the tie on Dame. Dame drove to the basket again. He just he just loves getting stuffed by the Lakers. Reeves got him a couple times. AD got him a couple times. Uh, AD ended up uh, today passing Kevin McHale for 30th on the all-time blocks list. He is still not a defensive player of the year for some reason, although he literally made game three plays defensively tonight. So I don't know. Do with that information what you will. Uh, show me Gobert's Vorp or something. I don't know. But he was amazing. He was sensational. And Austin Reeves, we've talked about him being high. We've talked about him being low. He's got to step up. Boy, oh, boy, he stepped up. He had a triple-double. He almost had the game-winner in regulation, but he missed. And he hit big buckets later. Uh, Dean Woody was amazing. In the third quarter, when the Lakers were down by, like, 18, D'Lo hit three threes, and he brought it back down to eight points. And, you know, the Bucks rallied back. But those little runs, I think, kind of helped keep the team alive. And Spencer Dinwiddie. Not a great game, but he hit a big three late that was really, really huge. And I didn't hear any Darvin Ham slander tonight. Dime. Everyone, they weren't really praising him, but they were leaving him alone because they were like, he pushed all the right buttons. He put Spencer in, uh, despite the fact that D'Lo was still back, kind of rewarded him, went went with like four guards basically because he had uh, D'Lo, Dinwiddie, Reeves. Um, and then he had, uh, I think he started, we had three guards and then he had Rui and then AD starting there. 
I wrote an article for Silver Screen and Roll about like that's probably the lineup they'll use when they don't have uh, LeBron James minutes uh, happening. And it was a whole game of that. So I was like, oh, yeah, of course, they went with the, with that lineup, which I thought would be pretty good. And it was just incredible, and it, just an incredible game. I, I didn't think they were going to win it. And then once they got into overtime, I'm like, they have to figure this out because uh, AD ended up, I think, knocking elbows with Middleton. He was limping around. He still was able to to, to play the, like 52 minutes. I think it's the most minutes by a Lakers since Kobe Bryant. So whenever you're doing stuff like that, you know, you're doing something right. So just incredible game from AD. Again, we've talked about it before. He is now – the main guy on this team. He's now the best player. He's now the MVP. Uh, Dime, what were your thoughts about this just ridiculous game by the Lakers against the Bucks? Austin Reeves. Austin Reeves competed like crazy in this game. And I think when I turned on the game in the second half, I watched the whole second half. I missed the entire first half. So I watched the whole second half. And this guy, Reeves, he was getting offensive rebounds kicking it out to D'Lo for threes. And that showed me how hard he was fighting and also defensively. Ever since that game where he kind of locked up SGA, he's been defending much better one-on-one. Yeah. Getting physical, putting a hand up, really contesting. His body language on defense is really good. He was finding guys for open shots in the pick and roll all game long. And Anthony Davis, I thought – when we talk about competing hard, at one point of this game, he was 7 for 22. You go on Twitter, you were seeing all the Giannis owns AD. Why was this ever a debate? All that. And then as the game went on, you saw AD start to defend Giannis really well. And then the, the Bucks started going more Dame Giannis pick and roll with Giannis as the roller instead of throwing it to Giannis. Because when AD was guarding him, he did a good job. When someone else was guarding him, Lakers were double teaming. And guys yeah. like Malik Beasley were open. He was breaking, and I think that was kind of poetic as a Laker fan because Malik Beasley's been playing really well for the Bucs, didn't shoot up for the Lakers, missed a ton of big shots in this game. And then Dame. Seems like all the big losses that the Bucs have, the common theme is that he's breaking. I mean, he had plenty of chances to kind of put the Lakers away, shot 9 for 29. I think one thing that was huge, if you're a Laker fan looking at this game, is throughout the game, even though the Lakers were down, their defensive effort didn't really wane like that. They stayed competing. And a Milwaukee Bucks team whose offense has always been a little iffy in the Giannis era, you knew there was a chance if they start missing shots, the right guys get hot, Lakers can get back in it. AD was – you know, the thing about AD is, though, Edwin, it's the same thing as last year where he's aggressive. He, he can, if he's aggressive, he's catching the ball close to the basket. He can be dominant. But the thing is – Partially his appetite to score and also the fact that he doesn't have the same mid-range anymore that he did when he first got to the Lakers, to me, has really hurt his one-on-one scoring. I know it might not be – you can see it in the stats this year, but I just don't believe that Anthony Davis can be a number one scorer on a championship team clear cut. He – might have had a better chance in in the 2018 Anthony Davis version or the 2020 Anthony Davis version. But since he's kind of lost that jump shot, it's looked a little better. But even Billy Mack was saying on the telecast, he's shooting like 20-something percent from three. And he's never been a great three-point shooter. But his 18-footer, his mid-range, was a lot better than me when he first got on the team. Uh, and I think you saw that last year in the playoffs against the Nuggets. He could not score outside the paint. So I think AD is a beast. He was making threes. I still think he's awesome. He's been the best player on the team. I agree with you and all that. But I think as a number one option, I don't think he's the guy that would lead you to a title because of his lack of scoring. But not everybody can be the leading guy on a title team, clear cut. At best, he's already been like a 1B. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. And yeah, I think that's fair. Just to finish off, Reeves was insane. So many big shots throughout the game. And it was just a gutsy win, one of the best of the season for the Lakers. And I also think Rui Hachimura has been really good lately, and we haven't talked about him enough. No, we haven't. 14 rebounds. He's not known for his rebounding. Uh, again, in that article I mentioned, like, oh, and Vando, if Vando comes back and is able to play, he might take some of Rui's minutes because of that. He's a good defender, and he can rebound. Those are two things Rui doesn't do well. And you need, you know, defense. No no boards, no rings. And you need good defense, especially when you're facing the best teams in the league, which is what's left when you get to the first, second Western Conference Finals, right? So <laughs> you, I need you to get the board. I need you to stop people. You can't do either. It doesn't matter if you score. You're not going to be on the floor unless you score like at a Trey Young level, right? And Rui does not. 
he did the little things uh, today. Defensively, he was fine. He wasn't great, but he was fine. And he he slammed on the boards. He was crashing on 14 rebounds. Uh, you give that kind of effort, yeah, you're going to be on the floor because we need that. And to your point, uh, LeBron is still just like about a point above um, AD on the season, 25.4. AD is 24.6. And again, this team isn't right now a championship level team. I think it's a little too too early to say something like that. They're uh, a dangerous dark horse team. That's what they are right now. So you're right. If he can't be number one now, uh, a team higher, that's probably not true. But again, I don't think he has to be. Uh, Powell never was, right? You could be an incredible 1B, especially as a, as a big. We just need to pair you with the right uh, guard, right wing to kind of, you know, take care of that scoring for you. And hey, you clean up the boards, you'd be an incredible defender. We're going to get you some post touches, you know, finish finish the plays at the rim, clean up the clean up the rim and, and, and put it back. You can you can be a twenty and twelve guy, and, and we we can win a lot of games if we have a guy who can score, you know, 28, 27, 31 and and take care of that offensive load. So something again, uh, we'll get into that in the in the in the uh, summertime, I'm sure. But uh, that's all I'm going to say all time for now. But yeah, um, great win, four in a row, uh, the highest uh, winning percentage they've had, and they still got an outside chance there of uh, of making some noise and, and getting past uh, that nine ten. So far, that's kind of been the story, the 9-10 seed for, for the Lakers. And I don't know, they, they still need another good week and we're going to get into it, but but they, they've, they're they giving themselves an opportunity. All they can do right now is win their games and get help. They're winning their games, so we'll see if they get the help. All right, let's go into standings watch here. Uh, we'll start with the Eastern Conference. Uh, we'll do the way we normally do. We'll start at number 10, uh, the official teams that would be in the play-in if it ended now. Number 10 right now would be Atlanta, 9 Bulls, 8 Sixers, Sixers dropping now with, with all the injuries and everything. Seven Heat, six Pacers, five Magic, four Knicks, three Cavs, two Bucks, and one Celtics. All right, Dime, you just heard the one through ten there. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you want to kind of dive into with the Eastern Conference? Nets are officially out. I think we got to really think about where they're at as a franchise right now. You know, traded – KD and Kyrie Irving, but they traded their picks for Harden. Like, what is their future looking like right now? Mikhail Bridges is your franchise player. Ben Simmons didn't really play much this season. Cam Thomas is a young and talented player, but like, yikes. Yeah. Um, Atlanta, Chicago, I don't have much to say about them. Same with Philly. Miami, by the way. Everyone's injured. Everyone's out. Like, are they this this whole this has to be the year where they can't just pull a rabbit out of a hat at the end of the season? Like, they, I don't know. They're only one game in the loss column back of the Pacers at six though. That's the funny part is they can still avoid the plan. Uh, Orlando though, it's looking like they're going to be in the playoffs. Five seed right now, three games in the loss column above Indiana. So. That really impresses me because I didn't have the Pacers over them, but I did have the Heat and the Sixers and the Hawks over them. Sixers, of course, no MB, but Heat and Hawks being under them, good for the Magic. It's looking like an impressive season for them. And then I got nothing else except for that Glenn Rivers is doing a little bit better with the Bucks. But they are 5-5 five and five in their last 10. Um, the Celtics, by the way, last bit of the East, they're looking like they're going to have a 60-win season, Edwin, and 60-win teams. Don't get those. Don't say it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just for those just listening, I'm rubbing my eyes. I'm like, oh my god, the thought of the Celtics. I've been avoiding talking about the Celtics as much as I can because that's a dang good team. Ah, I don't even like saying it. It just makes my stomach hurt. But uh we'll get to them later. They've been number one all season, though they've been a dominant team all year. Of course. With a team like that, you always have concerns, you know, uh, the skepticism in you. It's like, oh, I've seen them fail before. But, I mean, the proof's in the pudding. They've been knocking on the door for a while. And you know what happens when teams keep knocking on the door? Uh, eventually the door breaks down or they just implode and, you know, they trade with their talent. They're not at that point. So uh, they're going to have a really great chance this year. We'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the East, the uh, main thing I want to talk about is, yeah, kind of that bridge playing – like that five through seven, I think it's not solidified. I think the top four is, it's super close. I, I know the Celtics are solid. They're one. I think the Bucks are also safe at two. 
after that, I do think it's going to be Cavs Knicks, but it's very tight. So a bad week can definitely change it. But I, I feel number one and two, I feel very comfortable about three and four, a little less. And then I think six through ten, so six through like eight is where it gets really interesting. Nine, ten. The Bulls and Hawks are definitely just there because that the play in goes up to ten. Those teams do not they're they're out. They're they're, they're not gonna be I don't even think they're gonna make it uh, in the top eight when the play in's over. I just don't think they have the talent for it. Uh but the rest is interesting. I do think the Magic are probably going to stay there, but the Pacers and then the, the Heat, you're right, everyone's injured, but what if they start coming back? They're only a couple games back in, in the loss column. I think if they don't do it right now, you're right. This will be the year where we say, hey, the Magic's over. You, you it Turns out you can't be a 7-8 a seed and keep on uh, you know, making finals appearances just because you got Jimmy Butler. Uh, if Jimmy does it this year, honestly, just put him in the Hall of Fame now. <laughs> like, just yeah, cut it, cut it off. I'm saying it right now. If he, if they end up a seven seed and they beat the Bucks again, like he should get a statue before anyone because that is ridiculous. Like, you should give him the ring just, just on merit alone because that, that's an incredible feat if he does it this year uh, with with a team that's that's you know only a couple games above 500, and he hasn't also played himself and they, they you know they've lost games. Man, that, that's going to be interesting. But I'm definitely intrigued in the East. I think it's the most interesting Eastern Conference for me this, this season because it's so tight. And I think it's also going to come down to the wire. Um, the cream of the crop is clearly uh, Celtics Bucks, But I think you're going to see some really fun, interesting battles there. I think that second round is going to be really, really good in the East. So I'm looking forward to keeping an eye on it. And just like you said, your guess is as good as mine with Brooklyn. They're just in the mud. They're going to have to just draft incredibly well. And... You know, drafts can be fool's gold. You don't you don't have control over what's going on uh, with the draft pools. You don't have control over who's available. The ping pongs cannot go your way, and then you can get it wrong. I just think you know, it, it, it's tough when you're you don't. I don't I don't think it's a, a wise move for a franchise to say, oh, we got like seven or eight draft pick. I just don't think it works that way. Um, you want a couple, but uh, more importantly, you need to build a good roster, and they haven't done that, so that's where they're at. All right, let's go to the West. I have a question, Dime. We've Pretty much been consistent on we're staying with the 10. These are the 10 for the first time ever in like a month. I get to ask you, should we mention that 11 team? Yes, we should. Even All right, here they go. H Town, baby. Let's go. We're back. Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. Houston is back in the mix just when you thought they were out. They pull you back in. Why? They are 36 and 35, and the Warriors have been falling off a cliff. They won tonight, but they've been falling off a cliff. So they're 32 and 34. So it's just the game difference there. And with us having about a dozen games left, a game can be made up. So they're back in the mix. We thought they were dead in the water, but shout out to the Rockets, man. They've been playing some really good basketball. I didn't think it was going to matter, but then after uh, the previous Warriors lost, I'm like, okay. I think at this point we, we have to respect that they're they're in the mix and they're in the mix, man. They're playing good good basketball. They got a young team. I don't think they'd hate it if they make they snuck in there and got the ten seed and said, "Hey, let's you know uh, we might not make the playoffs, but like give those give those kids a chance to you know kind of gain that experience and and get a shot at it." So yeah, they're they're at number eleven. So we'll start with them. Uh, moving on from the Rockets at eleven, we have the Warriors now at ten. Two and a half game deficit uh, from the Lakers, so it's looking tough for them to climb. But at this point, they also got to worry about getting kicked out with the Rockets nipping at their heels. All right, nine we have the Lakers, eight we have the Suns, and at seven we have the Sacramento Kings. Now that's the playing picture. This is what it looks like right now. If it's over, these teams are guaranteed a spot in the playoffs. You have number six, the Dallas Mavericks, five, the Pelicans, four, your LA Clippers, three, Minnesota Timberwolves. Two, Oklahoma State Thunder, and number one, we have the Denver Nuggets. All right, Dime, up to you. Where do you want to start? Houston is on a nine-game winning streak. That's impressive. The hottest team in the NBA. It's I think nice. the Warriors will still make it, but they're clinging on for dear life, and they better sharpen up. As far as the Warriors, I think Steph Curry this whole season, he has looked old closing games in the sense that he's kind of run out of legs offensively, and teams have attacked him more defensively. And it's not like in 2022 when he was standing up to the task and not being taken advantage of. He's been taken advantage of like the 2015, 2016, that era. And I think he's not – he's still one of the best players in the NBA, but and but he's kind of declined since 2022, which is normal at his age. Right. You know, I think he's like in the stage that Kobe was in in like 2011 and 12 type of thing. Yeah. You know? 
So that's not to say about Steph. Uh, Lakers playing really good ball. Four straight wins, seven and three in the last ten. But the West, yeah, it's very competitive. Phoenix, I've heard they haven't been playing well. Their center play has been suspect all year long. I'm going to start keeping my eye on them a little bit more as the season closes down because they've only got 10 games left. Sacramento is about where I'd expect them to be. Dallas is getting dangerous. Five straight wins and they're 9-1 in their last 10. Luka and Kyrie starting to really click at the right time. I don't know how good of a team they're going to be defensively, to, you know, because I think that's going to indicate how far they go. But offensively, you know where the ball's going, and yet it's still going to be so hard to stop those two. Yeah. As far as New Orleans, they're on our heels. The Brandon Ingram injury is very unfortunate. The Clippers are playing some of the worst basketball of any team involved in postseason conversations right now. It's the tr simple truth. They got to pick it up. Kawhi Leonard, by the way, Edwin, just hasn't had enough 30 point games for me. He doesn't have a, a big, hungry enough scoring appetite in the regular season for me. He plays in the flow of the game. He doesn't get to the basket enough because he's not very quick and he's been through a lot of injuries. And he doesn't, sh I counted today, he's only shot 20 plus times, nine times this season. And he's played 66 games. I bet you LeBron, at his old age, he's not known to be a scorer, even though he's the all time leading scorer ever, <laughs> has shot 20 plus times more than 10 times. Yeah, for sure. I don't even have to look it up. There, there's no way he's not in double digits in, in right. 20, 20 field goal attempts for sure. So, Absolutely. and then the top three is getting solidified. Denver, OKC, and Minnesota. We knew about Denver, but I just want to give a shout out to OKC and Minnesota. I don't know if anyone really had them top three in the West. Nobody I knew did, at least. So, shout out to them. They've proven everyone wrong, and it's been one of the more shocking ascendances in uh, recent memory. Yeah, no, I think that's fair, especially for OKC. I think there there were some people who thought, oh, you know, the Gobert lovers and Cat, they're like, they're so big, they're so talented. And that's kind of panned out. The OKC, I don't think anyone saw a jump like this. So I'll definitely say that one for sure is one of those uh, ones. For me, the things I want to talk about mainly is, um, yeah, the, the play-in is starting to get solidified a little bit. It, it looks like 11 Houston's sneaking in, so they have like another week. If they can just it, – it's a lot to ask. <laughs> when you already won nine straight, can you go to like 12, 13? But if they can, I'm, I'm not a believer the Warriors are going to hang on 100%. If I had to bet, I would say they will just because I'll, I'll trust the talent. And they still have a one-game edge, so they, they have a little bit of an advantage. But, man, it's it's not, it's getting scary out there. It's getting scary. And, and yeah, they're, they're the opposite. They're not looking good. So they have to worry about fighting for, for dear life here on that number 10 spot. So that's definitely a concern. And, yeah, I think I think the top six is probably solid now. I think, like you said, the, the Mavs are just on the heater. I think it's going to continue. Maybe the Kings can sneak in there, but I think it's going to be those six. The top three are definitely secure. I think even if the Clippers have a bad week, they're not going to jump down to the planes, you know, area. I don't think that's going to happen. And same with the Pelicans. And I, I believe the Mavs will also. They still have to hold the fort down. It's just too tight to, to call it yet, but I think those will be your six. So then the question is just where does the, the rest of the seven through ten go? I think this will be the week that the Lakers either get really close to the Suns or it'll just become a, a factor that they're just a little too far behind and they keep, you know, the ninth spot. And I really want them to at least get to eight because, um, one, that make, that means you don't have to go through two uh, elimination games. That, that's an advantage. Even though nine would be the home court, you'd rather be at eight. And also, they can jump up to seven maybe if they win that game, right? And – we don't know what the standings are going to look like, but not that you'll jockey for, for position, but you can definitely look at it and say, okay, we have two options. At least we have two different options. Maybe we can think about it a little, although, of course, you just want to win games, but it gives you just a little more freedom. Also, maybe being seven is better, right? Compared to 9-10, that means you're going to have to win that nine game, then go on the road and beat a desperate team, trying not to get eliminated from the playoffs, losing to a lower seed. It's just hard to do. We've seen it happen. It happened to the Warriors, actually, Um when when they played the Lakers, where they lost to the Grizzlies and got kicked out, but it's tough to do. So you don't you don't want to make things harder for yourself. It's already hard. So get the highest seat you can uh, for the Lakers right now. That the goal there is eight. Then you think about seven. Then you think about six. But it's got to be one step at a time. Thankfully, the Warriors have fallen apart, so they've created some separation. But now they got to try and see if they can jump up there to eight. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the upcoming games this week. We'll preview everything until uh, up to Sunday. We'll probably record on Monday. So next game, it's the next time you 
probably when you're listening to this, they'll be they'll be playing because they're early games here. We got the Clippers at the Sixers at uh, four o'clock on ESPN, and we got the Lakers at Grizzlies at five. Uh, Dimes, we have both teams playing at virtually the same time, early East Coast games, uh, East Coast times anyway. <laughs> yeah, I see the dead eyes there. <laughs> so Clippers, Sixers, uh, are they going to bounce back and win this one on the road, the Clippers? Nope. I don't think they were. they're playing very well, and this is James Harden's return, so it's going to be so hostile. You know what? I'm going to say they get it done. Come on, they, they got to win some point. It, it, it's got to happen. So I'm, I'm going to go with the, the Clippers win. Just off of belief of like, you know what? He called them soft. They're going to step up. And he's going to be like, oh, there we go. Yeah. So I'm going to we'll go with that it. one. All right. Now, next game we have Lakers Grizzlies. Tough one. I mean, the Lakers are – I'm not even going to – you know what? I'm not going to set the table. I'm just going to ask you what happens. Lakers Grizzlies. I know they just got the lot their lives kicked out of them in this game against Milwaukee. But I say LeBron gives it a go, leads a team to a – victory over a Grizzlies team that doesn't really have much to play for except for the individual players trying to prove that they're NBA players at this point. Lakers get the dub. Continue yeah. their hot uh, play. But you know I what? Know. I mean, if I don't watch the game, they might lose because I've been watching. Again, every time I watch recently, the Lakers win games. I'm going to need you to turn off the Clippers game and watch the Lakers do this here. Yeah, I'm, I'm nervous because of the circumstance. I haven't checked the, you know, a good follow on Instagram. It's Mike Trudell, who's actually a great follow anywhere you, you are on social media. And he, he shares sometimes, you know, on his Instagram story, he'll be like, oh, we just got off the plane. I'm like, I'm scared if they're even on the, off the plane at this point, you know, because again, the double overtime game, a five o'clock start, you do the math, they're probably touching down in Memphis from Milwaukee at like two in the morning. And then it's like two in the morning, one guy's ankle made him miss a game. AD knocked knees today and played 50-something minutes. Like, ugh. And then the Grizzlies are young, hungry, like you said, at home. It, it's not – I'm like, if they had an extra day off, I would have no problem saying the Lakers are going to win. I'm still going to pick them, but it would not surprise me at all if they lose because of, of the circumstance and the situation. But, hey, I mean, this late in the season, you got to suck it up and just figure it out. So I'm going with Lakers win as well. A little nervous. All right, Friday, more Lakers and Clippers games. we got the Clippers at Magic happening at 4 o'clock. Um, I'm going to go with the Magic here. I just feel like the Magic are rolling. I think the Clippers will get the win against the Sixers, but lose against the Magic. Dime, do you have them extending the winning streak, losing streak at this point? Or, or do you have the Clippers winning this? Oh, yeah, they're going to lose. The Magic are too young and too athletic. Wow. My yep. goodness. Okay, I'm writing it down. We got the L's are just stacking up. You have the opposite of a perfect week happening right now. It's like imperfectly. <laughs> Man, negative. I forgot how negative Dime gets. If you know, you know. But he can, he can get dark over there. I might have to do a wellness check on Dime real quick. I have to go to go to a hookah lounge or something. Kind of. <laughs> All right, Lakers Pacers, four o'clock, same day, uh, same time on NBA TV. Man, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna play with house money. Lakers are rolling. They get an extra day off. I'm going to go with the Lakers win. But the Pacers, we know what juggernauts they are offensively. Uh, Dime, what do you think happens here? I'm going with Indiana. I think they're just going to have one of those games where they go off offensively and the Lakers just don't have the juice that night to get over the hump. But I think it'll be a good game. Yeah, I can see that 100%. Especially if if they win the Grizzlies game, playing the back-to-backs with like (laughs) half their players, like (laughs) exhausted. I can definitely see them saying, hey, I mean, we're not going to go on the six-game Eastern Conference road trip and win everything. So. That might be just the one that they finally lose at, but we'll see. All right. And then the final pair of games, we have those matinees happening on Sunday. We got Clippers at Hornets at three and Lakers at Nets at three. So we'll start with Clippers Hornets. Uh, I'm going with a, a Clippers W. I mean, the Hornets are just, they're just kind of playing off the string here. I think, I think the, the Clippers take care of business. Uh, Dime, who do you have winning? Clippers will win that one. And then the Lakers will beat the Nets too. Okay. So you got, and yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, the Nets are also just kind of playing things out. So I think the Lakers take care of business. So let me just get that down. So we have those recorded and we got um, W's uh, on Sunday for the Lakers and we're split on Clippers. Oh no, you have the Clippers uh, beating the Hornets, right? Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Okay. Got it. Okay, cool. So we have the clean sweep the Sunday matinee clean sweep on the East coast. That's going to be interesting. So we'll see what happens. All right. So it's getting good. It's getting interesting. Uh, it's getting exciting. This is this is March. It's it's we're getting to the the crux of the season here. Really excited for it. So um, that's going to conclude uh, this episode. 
of Basketball on Figueroa. That is episode 22 of Basketball on Figueroa. Once again, I'm your host, Aaron Garcia. That was Darian Viziri, a.k.a. Time Dropper. And we out. Shout out to UCLA women, by the way. Yeah.